Our immune system has a remarkable ability to fight almost any disease. When we catch a common cold, a throat infection, diarrhea, or even chickenpox, it is our immune system that fights and defeats it, often without us even realizing it. Even for diseases where external preventive measures exist, it is ultimately our body's own defense system that eliminates the threat. These external measures only serve to introduce the pathogen in a safe way. But the actual work of producing antibodies, recognizing the enemy, and mounting a defense happens entirely within our body. But here's the real mystery. Our immune system does not just fight known diseases. It can also defend us against threats that do not even exist yet, even ones that may emerge 100 years from now. How is this possible? How does our immune system recognize and fight such a massive variety of diseases? How does it identify infections and produce the right antibodies, even for pathogens it has never encountered before? And if our immune system is so powerful, why do so many people still succumb to infections? These are the exact questions we are about to explore in this video. Hi friends, welcome to a new video from Science Simplified for All. Pathogens like bacteria and viruses have existed on this planet for as long as life itself. This means they have been around long before the emergence of both traditional and modern medicine. Yet, despite this, we have managed to survive all this time. And the primary reason for that is our body's immune system. The immune system is the most complex system in the human body after the brain. It consists of multiple layers and a variety of specialized cells, each playing a crucial role. To make it easier to understand, let us use an analogy. Imagine that our body is like a small city in ancient times, and microorganisms like bacteria and viruses are the enemies trying to invade this city. A city's first line of defense is its outer walls, built to protect it from invaders. Similarly, the first layer of defense in our body is our skin. It acts as a barrier, shielding the body's internal parts from the external world. But when we say skin, we are not just referring to the outer layer that we can see. Other protective membranes inside our body, such as those lining the mouth, intestines and nasal passages, are also part of this first line of defense. A city cannot be completely sealed off with walls. Gates are required at various points for the movement of people and goods. These entry points are weak spots and always have additional protection. Similarly, our body also has entry points such as the mouth, nose and respiratory tract. These entry points have extra protective mechanisms. For example, mucus, a sticky fluid lining the nose and respiratory tract, traps bacteria and prevents them from entering the body. The lining of our stomach also has a special type of mucus, along with strong digestive acids, which help destroy harmful microorganisms before they can cause harm. Together, these mechanisms form our first line of defense. However, this is a passive defense system. It simply blocks invaders from entering, but does not actively fight them. This is why many do not consider it to be a part of the immune system itself. The real immune response happens when pathogens manage to get past these barriers. This is where the active defense system comes into play, which is what most people refer to as the immune system. The active immune system has two stages. The first is the general purpose immune response, known as the innate immune system, which fights all the types of pathogens. The second is the adaptive immune system, which is designed to target specific pathogens with precision. Next, we will explore how these two systems work. Now, imagine that the passive defenses we mentioned earlier, such as the skin and mucus, have been breached, allowing pathogens to enter the body. This can happen in different ways. For example, in the case of COVID, viruses entered the body through openings like the eyes, nose or mouth. Another way bacteria can enter our body is through a wound in the skin. For now, let us assume this is what has happened. In other words, imagine that the outer walls of our city have been broken and the enemies have managed to invade. As soon as bacteria come into contact with the cells near the wounded area, these cells begin to release chemical signals. 
These chemicals act as a danger signal, triggering a series of responses. First, the blood capillaries near the wound expand, allowing more fluids to flow into the affected area. This is why we often see swelling around a wound. The increased fluid supply brings raw materials needed for repair, while also helping to clear out damaged cells. Second, the body temperature around the wound slightly increases. This speeds up the metabolic rate of the surrounding cells, helping the wound heal faster. Third, these chemical signals act as an alert message, a call for help. They indicate that the body is under attack, activating the first stage of the immune response, known as the innate immune system. In response, the general-purpose immune cells, the foot soldiers of our body's defense, rush to the battlefield. These immune cells continuously patrol the bloodstream, ready to respond to any threat. When they detect the distress signals from the affected cells, they move toward the site of infection. Since the blood capillaries in the area have already expanded, these immune cells can easily pass through and reach the battlefield. And with that, the battle begins. The first immune cells to arrive at the battlefield are the neutrophils. These are the foot soldiers of our body's defense system. They exist in large numbers and are highly aggressive and energetic. Neutrophils attack in multiple ways. They may release deadly chemicals to destroy bacteria, or they may engulf bacteria one by one and digest them. If the situation demands, they may even self-destruct, releasing a sticky net-like substance made from their own DNA to trap and kill bacteria. However, neutrophils are so aggressive that their attack often damages nearby healthy cells as well. But at this stage, there is no time to worry about collateral damage. The priority is to eliminate the invading enemy. If the number of invading bacteria is low, the neutrophils alone may be enough to contain the infection. But in some cases, the bacteria multiply rapidly after entering the body, increasing the numbers significantly. If the enemy forces become too large, the foot soldiers alone cannot win the battle. This is when the giants of our immune system enter the battlefield the macrophages. If a normal cell is the size of a human, a macrophage is as large as a wild bison. These massive immune cells have long arm-like extensions that allow them to grab, engulf and digest multiple bacteria at once. This process is called phagocytosis. Although neutrophils also use phagocytosis, they can only consume a few bacteria before self-destructing. Because of this, their lifespan is short. In contrast, macrophages can continue devouring bacteria for much longer without self-destruction. Additionally, macrophages help clear up the battlefield by removing the waste left behind by neutrophils' attacks. Together, neutrophils and macrophages do their best to contain the infection. Meanwhile, the body is also working on repairing the skin damage caused by the wound. If everything goes well, the battle ends here and the infection is brought under control. However, if the invading bacteria are too numerous or too strong, the situation escalates beyond the control of these first responders. This is when the body needs to deploy its specially trained commandos, the second stage of the immune response known as the adaptive immune system. The first step of this advanced defense system is the deployment of intelligence officers to the battlefield, these specialized cells are called dendritic cells. Their primary job is to collect samples of the invading bacteria that have infected our body. Dendritic cells are actually part of the innate immune system. As soon as they reach the site of infection, they engulf bacteria, much like macrophages. However, instead of fully digesting them, they break the bacteria into fragments and display these pieces on their surface. This may remind you of ancient warriors who wore necklaces made from the body parts of their defeated enemies. While it may seem similar, dendritic cells do this for a very specific purpose. Once they have collected bacterial fragments, dendritic cells do not remain on the battlefield. Instead, they rush to the immune system's headquarters, the lymph nodes. Apart from blood, our body has another circulating fluid known as lymph. Lymph is formed from blood but flows through a separate network of tubes called the lymphatic system. 
The most important centers in this system are called lymph nodes. When you are sick and visit a doctor, you may have noticed that they sometimes check for swelling on both sides of your neck. These swellings are enlarged lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are present in other parts of the body as well. During an infection, similar swelling can also appear in lymph nodes located in areas like the groin or underarms. After collecting bacterial samples, dendritic cells travel directly to the lymph nodes. There, they encounter a specialized group of immune cells known as T-cells. These are the highly trained commandos of our immune system, which we mentioned earlier. T-cells have a unique characteristic. They are all different from one another. Our lymph nodes contain a vast number of T-cells, each designed to recognize a specific type of bacteria. This means that for every possible bacterium that could exist in this world, at least one T-cell in our body will be capable of identifying and responding to it. Even if a completely new bacteria, one that has never been encountered before, enters our body, there will be a matching T-cell ready to respond. This is one of the most fascinating aspects of our immune system. But how is this possible? We will explore that soon. For now, our intelligence officer, the dendritic cell, is still waiting. It needs to find the exact T-cell that matches the bacterial fragments it carries. This is not an easy task. The dendritic cell moves through the lymph node, presenting the bacterial fragments it has collected to the receptors on different T-cells, testing them one by one. After countless attempts, one T-cell finally clicks. This particular T-cell is the precise match needed to fight this specific bacterium. Once identified, the dendritic cell activates the T-cell, triggering an immediate response. The T-cell begins to rapidly clone itself, multiplying into thousands of identical copies. In essence, an entire army of highly specialized immune commandos is formed, designed specifically to eliminate this type of bacteria. As soon as these T-cells reach the battlefield, the situation dramatically shifts in our favor. T-cells have two major types, but we will not go into that right now. What is important is that when T-cells arrive, their first job is to reactivate macrophages that have been fighting and are now exhausted. Using chemical signals, T-cells boost the efficiency of macrophages, making them even more aggressive in attacking bacteria. Additionally, the T-cells themselves directly seek out and destroy bacteria. Since their receptors perfectly match the bacterial markers, they can target and eliminate them with precision. At the same time, another important process is happening in the body. Inside the lymph nodes, alongside T-cells, there is another type of immune cell known as B-cells. Unlike T-cells, B-cells do not directly engage in combat. Instead, they specialize in producing chemical weapons called antibodies. Bacteria have specific proteins on their surface, known as receptors. These receptors help bacteria attach to and invade human cells. Antibodies, which are also proteins, are designed to bind precisely to these bacterial receptors. By doing so, they neutralize the bacteria, preventing them from attacking human cells. However, not all bacteria have the same receptors. Each type of bacteria has its own unique receptors, which means that a different antibody is needed to fight each type of bacteria. A single B cell can only produce one specific type of antibody. Just like T cells, B cells exist in many varieties. This ensures that for every possible bacterium in the world, at least one matching B cell exists in our body. The B cell specific to the invading bacteria will be present in our lymph nodes. As the bacteria travel through the lymphatic system, one particular B cell will recognize them. Once this happens, the B cell does not act immediately. First, it carries a sample of the bacteria to a previously activated T cell. The T cell verifies that it is the correct target and then activates the B cell. Once activated, the B cell rapidly multiplies, producing a large number of identical copies of itself. These newly formed B cells begin producing massive quantities of antibodies specific to the invading bacteria. The antibodies travel through the bloodstream to the site of infection where they bind to the bacteria's receptors, making them significantly weaker. Once weakened, 
the bacteria become easy targets for T-cells, macrophages and neutrophils, which work together to completely eliminate the infection. This is how our body completely eliminates an infection. Once the adaptive immune system's specialist commandos, T-cells and B-cells, are activated, they can usually bring infections under control. However, there is one problem. The adaptive immune system takes time to activate. That is its biggest drawback. T-cells and B-cells have another unique feature. Once an infection is completely eliminated, most of these cells die off since they are no longer needed. But a small number of them transform into memory cells. These memory cells do not disappear quickly. In some cases, they can last a lifetime. If the same bacteria infect the body again, these memory cells can respond immediately without any delay. As long as these memory cells remain in the body, the same pathogen will not be able to cause a significant infection again. Even though I have repeatedly used the word bacteria in this video, I actually mean any disease-causing microorganism, whether it is a bacterium, virus or something else. The correct term is pathogen, but for simplicity, I used bacteria since it is more familiar. While different pathogens may cause slight variations in immune response, the overall process remains the same. In reality, the immune system is much more complex, but I have simplified it for easier understanding. Now, let us explore an important question. How does our body create such an enormous variety of T-cells and B-cells capable of defending us against all known and unknown bacteria and viruses? Every cell in our body functions according to the instructions encoded in our DNA. From the moment the first cell is formed inside the mother's womb, our DNA structure is fixed. Every new cell that forms after that carries the exact same DNA, without any changes. This means that every cell in our body shares the same genetic information. The proteins required for each cell's function are produced based on the instructions within this DNA. As a result, what our cells can or cannot do is predetermined at birth. Our DNA provides genetic codes for fighting only a few diseases, but that is not enough to combat all possible infections. So how does our body manage to generate T-cells and B-cells capable of recognizing every possible disease? This is where our body uses a unique trick. When new T-cells and B-cells are formed, their DNA undergoes specific random modifications. This process occurs only in these immune cells. For B cells, these random changes occur in the DNA segments responsible for antibody production. For T cells, the changes happen in the DNA that produces receptor proteins, which help recognize bacteria. This random mixing and modification of DNA enables our body to generate billions of different types of T cells and B cells. As a result, no matter how new or unknown a pathogen may be, there will always be at least one immune cell that can recognize and fight it. However, this raises an important question. If our body can generate an immune response for any pathogen, why do so many people still die from infections? And why do we need vaccines for immunity? These questions do not have a single answer. The first reason was already explained in this video. The second reason is that pathogens have a major advantage over us, one that we do not possess. And third, in many cases, when a person dies from an illness, the immediate cause of death is not the pathogen itself. For example, in most COVID-related deaths, the virus was not the direct cause of death. These are complex topics that require detailed explanation. Due to time constraints, we cannot cover them all in this video. So, let us continue this discussion in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share it. For more videos like this, make sure to subscribe to this channel and enable the bell icon. Thank you.